second book of Samuel. When King David was settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from his enemies on every side, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God dwells in a tent. Nathan answered the king, Go, do whatever you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that night, the Lord spoke to Nathan and said, Go tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, Should you build me a house to dwell in? It was I who took you from the pasture and from the care of the flock to be commander of my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you went, and I have destroyed all your enemies before you. And I will make you famous like the great ones of the earth. I will fix a place for my people Israel. I will plant them so that they may dwell in their place without further disturbance. Neither shall the wicked continue to afflict them as they did of old, since the time I first appointed judges over my people Israel. I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord also reveals to you that he will establish a house for you. And when the time comes and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your heir after you, <coughs> sprung from your loins, and I will make his kingdom firm. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. Your house and your kingdom shall endure forever before me, and your throne shall stand firm forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Our second reading is a reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, to him who can strengthen you, according to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret for long ages, but now manifested through the prophetic writings and according to the command of the eternal God made known to all nations to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ be glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to, to God. God. The Lord be with you. And A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David and the virgin's name was Mary. Coming to her, he said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at what was said and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of David his father, and he will rule over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. But Mary said to the angel, how can this be? Since I have no relations with a man, and the angel said to her in reply, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, the power of the Most High will overshadow you. 
Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month for her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible for God. Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The Gospel of the Lord. I know that we have several students here in church this morning, and I don't want to, you know how it is being uh, once a teacher, always a teacher. Can't possibly allow the kids' brains to go to mush. You know, they're going to be out of school for a week, so we got we to build some new phonics lessons into the program here this morning, right? There's three words I'd like you to consider, especially the college students. They're the ones who are most concerned, and the grad students, they're the most concerned about, right? Minimize, maximize, and optimize. Can you just say them once so I know that they're in your head? Minimize, maximize, optimize, right? So minimize is you're trying to get to the lowest possible level of something. Maximize, you're trying to get to the highest possible level of something. And optimize, you're trying to get to the optimal or the best level of something. Sometimes we confuse maximize with optimize or minimize with optimize. If you're cooking a hamburger, is your goal to maximize the burger's time on the grill, minimize the burger's time on the grill, or optimize the burger's time on the grill? Because if you maximize it, it's going to have a hockey puck. If you minimize it, you're going to have something with salmonella or something. You optimize it so you get it just right. Even for family time at Christmas, is the goal to maximize, minimize, or optimize? Don't, I don't want to hear any of this stuff about family squabbles, right? And it might turn out that optimize is close to minimize in your book, but I think we could all agree if you maximize the time together, that can be forced fun and you all have to sit in the living room for 15 hours, like it or not, right? Minimize, okay, we're just going to do, a, we're just gonna do a, uh, a hit and run on that Christmas party. Optimize, you spend just the right amount of time. And so it is with health, with finances, with the spiritual life, with hamburgers on the grill, with all of it. And we can sometimes think the goal is either to maximize or to minimize, but the goal is to optimize. The goal is to optimize, and so it is with that sense of dependence on the Lord and that sense of partnership in the Lord. And the question, as we question choices all along through Advent, does the choice I'm making lead me to a deeper, to the optimal sense of cooperation with God and partnership with God and dependence on God? Or does it lead me to some sort of misguided maximizing of sense of dependence on God or an equally treacherous minimizing of the sense of dependence on God? Let's take a look at each one of those things and ask from the readings today and a reading that's not here today, what does that mean for us right now on Christmas almost Eve of 2017? One of those questions of maximizing dependence on God, that's the Yahoo approach, right? I'm not talking about Yahoo, the search engine. I'm talking about Yahoo, like, go nuts kind of approach. But sometimes, and we know this from Scripture, the dark side wants us to think that we'll just do nothing ourselves and leave it all to God. And where was the place in the Scripture where Jesus had to say, no, I'm not falling for that. I will, you will not put the Lord your God to the test. What, what was going on in that? The, yeah, the temptation in the wilderness, right? So of the three temptations, the devil says to Jesus, go up and throw yourself off the top of the temple parapet, and if, if God's really God and you really believe in God, God will send his angels and you stand, even knock your foot against a stone. And what does Jesus say? You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And we know that each one of us can stumble into that thing, ah, oh, just don't worry about it, God will take care of it. Hold on a second, Homer. <laughs> Right? In each one of these things, the, the challenge is to, to work as if it depends on us, to pray as if it depends on God. Jesus wasn't going to fall for that deal of jumping off the tower and expecting God to catch him. That's maximum dependence on God, but it's not inspired. It's not optimal. It's just weird. Right? You can see that there are places in Scripture, not today, but there are places in Scripture where people put the Lord their God to the test. 
And Jesus says, don't do that. You might think you're maximizing your dependence on God, but you're just being weird. Minimizing our dependence on God, that's the thing that happens today with David in the first reading. Now, David's story really is a nice story. David knows the Lord has treated him well, but David, if we really dig into this thing, we, say, we see that the Lord is saying, well, David, you're kind of forgetting. I really appreciate you wanting to build me a house. The story is there, this story unfolds in Jerusalem. It's a good time in David's history. The nation is at peace. It's starting to prosper. Saul, or um, yeah, King Saul has been all put to rest. It, it's, a, it's going the right way. And David says, you know, the Ark of the Covenant doesn't have a really great place, so let's build the Ark of the Covenant a good palace because I'm living in this palace of cedar and the Ark of the Covenant's in a tent, so let's do that for God. I think God needs us to do that. Yep, yep. So he tells good old reliable Nathan, Nathan, this is what I want to do. Nathan's first response is, good idea, but then God tells Nathan, Nathan, tell David, not a great idea. David's getting a little bit confused about who's God and who's David. And so God tells Nathan to tell David, tell David, remember David, I'm the one who pulled you up out of the pasture, right? You were, you were a really lost and sort of neglected kid when I found you. Nobody in your family could stand you. They didn't want you. They sent you to take care of sheep as far away from them as they could possibly send you. And then David, after that, remember, I'm the one who gave you power over King Saul, and I'm the one who led you on victories, and I'm the one who gave you prosperity. David, I really appreciate your effort here, but you're trying to talk about building me a house. I've built you a house, and I will continue to build you a house, double entendre. David's talking about a physical house. The Lord and Nathan are talking about a house as in a lineage, as in a descent, as in the royal family. And so David, it's nice of you to do that, but David, you do have this tendency every once in a while, you forget who's God and you forget who's David. David, you're David and I'm God. Okay, repeat after me, David. God, you are God and I am David. I am not God and you are not David. Right? I'm the one who depends on you. So David has this, this streak of minimizing his dependence on God. That's not the right way to go either. And we can see it in other places in Scripture where people act as if there is no God who's on their side. And then we get to the optimize, our lady in the gospel today, who gets to that inspired balance of dependence on God and cooperation with God. Not maximizing, not just saying, okay, God, you're completely in charge, nor is she saying to God, God, I'm completely in charge. What she's saying there with the be it done unto me according to thy word is, I agree to you, Mr. Angel. And what Mr. Angel has said to Mary is, listen, this is a partnership. You will conceive the child. You will bear the child. You will name the child. Meanwhile, God, God will give him the throne of David, his father. You don't need to worry about that, Mary. God will have him be called the son of the Most High. You don't need to worry about that. That's not your job either. And God will be the one who brings people to him. Sound good? Be it done unto me according to thy word. In other words, absolutely, yeah. I'm scared, but I'm saying yes. And so what we get there is, Mary, here's your job. Check, check, check. And here's what's not your job. Check, check, check. And we're going to work it out. And Mary says, great. Mary says yes to this inspired dependence. Mary says yes to this inspired cooperation with God. Not like the devil was trying to get Jesus to do, throw yourself off the temple. That's nothing. That's, that's just not right. Nor was Mary into what, Mary, what David was doing of, I'm in charge and let, I'll take care of God. No. Mary gets to just the right balance. It's God using me to work in the world. What does it have to do with us? Friends, it has an awful lot to do with the way in which each one of us commits ourselves to that ministry of caring for others. Ultimately, the readings today are readings about people being called to care for others. David being called to care for the nation, Mary being called to care for Jesus. And in that call to caring for others, we make choices. This is how I'm going to do it. This is how I will approach it. This is my level of commitment. This is my way of managing it. Every one of us shares in ministries of caring. For some, it's really obvious. You're caring for 
relatives with illness. In Somerset County, especially, especially in Somerset County, and this, just on the south side, mostly of the 287 corridor, we know that the opioid crisis here is as bad as it is any place in the nation and that parents are caring for kids to try to keep them on track, and for those who've taken the unfortunate plunge, are trying to get them back on track. We have people who are caring for just the work, the everyday caring of raising kids. We have everybody involved in caring for the well-being of the parish and the people to whom the parish reaches out. Everybody's involved in one way or another in a caring ministry. And the choices we make about that caring ministry deserve to be held up to this question of our dependence on God, our relationship with God, our sense of God being God and us being us. And that we want to get it to that place in the middle, just like Mary did. Not to minimize our sense of dependence on God, not to maximize our sense of dependence on God in terms of being reckless and saying, anything goes, God will take care of it. No, no. It's that way that the Blessed Mother did it that's so inspired. Here's God's part of the deal. Here's my part of the deal. We'll work together in God. It's all about what you want. On this side, with minimizing God's input in the situation, it's that what we call that tendency to be a control freak. I've got to manage every single step of this process. There's a difference between being responsible and being a control freak, right? I've got to manage where my kids are every single minute of every moment. And it, of course, it's a generational thing. I still laugh about the time when I was 14, my little brother was 12, my big brother was 15, and she dumped, all, dumped us all off at Kennedy Airport. <laughs> Have a nice time. Jamie and Peter were going to California, I was going to Switzerland. What do I do when I get there? You'll figure it out. Just go. Call when you're, no, don't call. It's too expensive. It's a generational thing. It's a, it's, we all have our different styles, right? But I would ask you to notice that we do make that choice about the level of managing that we're going to do. We can't control every little thing. We can be a control freak, which is associated with what David was up to, minimize God's role in it. We can also just be sloppy and mismanage it and not commit it and don't follow up on the details. Pretend like it's all God's job and I don't have any role in it. Well, that's no good either. It's that happy space in the middle imitating Our Lady. So I'd ask you to notice one place where you really have the balance right, where your choices, you know that they're inspired choices, you know that they are the choices that line up with God's hope because they lead you to that inspired sense of dependence on God. It might be the way you're caring for a parent who's going through a tough time, or a kid, or it might be your daily routine with the kids, where you're saying, God, I, I can't control everything. You're God. I'll let you be God. I want you to watch over this whole situation. I'll do with the best that I can, but I'm not going to forget that you're God. Can you name one place where you are truly getting it right with that inspired balance, and you've made choices that lead you to imitate the Blessed Mother. Be it done unto me according to your word. You've optimized your dependence on God. You really seem to have it right. Therefore, you can trust the choice that led you to that. And one place where you maybe have to work on it. Just one place where maybe you're being a little bit of a control freak and you've got to give the kid or the relative some room to breathe and, and to walk with God. The goal is not to minimize dependence on God. The God is not, goal is not to maximize what we call dependence on God. The goal is to optimize it. Where are you getting it right? And where maybe, just maybe, do you need to work on it just a little bit? So three cheers for you who are not double dippers, going to Mass on Sunday morning, and then maybe again Sunday night, huh? There were so many six o'clockers at, at the 4.45 yesterday, it was great fun to see. I, I, I thought the six o'clockers would be the biggest double dippers. 
because they would just come to the usual mass on Sunday at 6 o'clock and say, oh, this is for Sunday and for Christmas. No, it isn't, Homer. Okay, come on. <laughs> so I'll see you again, I hope, over the course of this weekend. Uh, on the way out, if you can figure out who is the Santa in the Santa picture on the door, I'll, I'll give you a dollar. Okay? There's a Santa picture on the door to the hospitality room. You can tell who the big goon is in the front of the picture, but who's the Santa in the picture? So you do it all the time. You do it all the time. Notice where you're getting it so right. And I'm looking out at a bunch of people who have taken extraordinary care of elderly relatives, of brothers and sisters who've needed help, of kids who've been in rehab, of teachers who've really had to take good care. And you do an extraordinary job. I'd ask you just to frame it in terms of today's readings, why it's an extraordinary job. Because what you've done is you've managed to get that sort of Blessed Virgin Mary mix of, yeah, it's a joint effort here, God. I know you're, you are using me to bring peace to my loved one. So Lord, make sure I get it right. Make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm depending on you. Work as if it depends on me. Pray as if it depends on you. Lord, let me not forget that this is a partnership. Let me not throw myself off the temple in a reckless attempt to prove how loving you are. Neither let me box you out and decide that I'm God. Lord, thank you for giving me the grace to get the balance right. So where are you getting it right? Where have you gotten it right? And know that the Lord is just looking down on you and saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. And maybe where do you need to work on it? Just a little bit. I'll see you soon. I'll see you this afternoon. I'll see you tomorrow morning, whatever. I'll tell you Merry Christmas then. Meanwhile, let us pray. <laughs>